morning, and I have known Jesse Jones since probably about 1996, do you think? We were seminary students together at the uh, Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, and we went, we took a class called Contemporary Revival in America, and we went to the Brownsville Revival. That was our field trip, was the Brownsville Revival, so we got to know one another on that field trip. We had a special audience with Steve Hill and, and, uh, and Kilpatrick in the uh, choir room. Remember that? That was the time when they walked past me and I didn't know they were there and I got knocked two rows over by the power of God. And uh, then they gave us front row seats at the revival and we got to experience the power of God in such a powerful way that we, we were literally transformed by that. And then we went back to our rooms after that. We had one, one student had a room, and we all went into that room, and we had an amazing prayer meeting following that. And I remember, Jesse, I was slain in the Spirit, and I felt like I was about three feet underwater. I could just feel the water washing over me, and I was so drunk that they had to carry me back to my room and where Bruce was waiting on me. And, uh, and, and even Bruce was being touched in the bed that night. He told me the things that the Lord was speaking to him while we were in our service. But anyway, uh, Jesse and I remained friends along with Reggie, who was from India. And it was, we were like three revival buddies hanging out together, uh, just pursuing God with all of our hearts. And also I went down at times and took classes and stayed at their house with, with um, his amazing uh, wife, Tracy, and she had this daycare history that we'll have to share with you at some point. But we have stayed in touch. Jesse has a, a master's degree in divinity, and then he went on to Regent University and got his doctorate of ministry. He has three sons that are in their uh, master's degree at Regent University and a daughter who is in Bible school at uh, Southeastern College. So he has a great heritage. And he's had a great ministry. You grew up in this stuff just like I did, right? So Jess, and when, I, when we got in a conversation, I said, Jesse, you got to come and, and share with my church because he is like you and I. He's hungry for more of God. Amen. We were touched and transformed in revival, and we are not going to stop until we see revival again in America. Amen. So I want you to, would you stand, and would you give a great big round of applause to my friend and your friend, Mr. Jones. God bless you, buddy. I love you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a privilege to be here with you this morning. By the way, Jesse, let me interrupt. This is the best church. I know. I can Lincoln. feel it. Yeah, okay. Just Th long this, as you know that. This is a place of revival. I'm telling you, God's about to move in Lincoln, Nebraska. There is a fresh, great awakening coming to the body of Christ. And, and I hear the Spirit saying the intensity of it is so much greater than anything we've ever seen before. How many of you just want to see a move of God like we've never seen before? Boy, I know I do. I'm in the right place this morning. It's, it's, it's amazing that that precious lady came up that was speaking about their grandparents. And she said that we needed a move of God, of the love of God. And you know, that's what I came here with this morning. A message burning on my heart about the love of God. You know, it seems like a simple message, but... But God's crazy about us. He loves us. You matter to Him. He's going to do something special in your life. He hasn't forgotten you. It doesn't matter about the weaknesses that you see in yourself. God wants to approach you and do miracles in your life. And this is a season where He's going to begin to just break off the condemnation of yesterday. You know, a lot of people think, you know, I know what I've done when I was 16. I just don't think God could really use me. I know how much beer I used to drink. I know about all the things that some other people know I've done. I just don't ever think God could ever raise me up again. But I want to say something to you this morning. The cross was more than enough. It was more than enough to wash that and nail every transgression to the tree and give you right standing with God. And this morning, you stand before God perfectly righteous. You'll never get more righteous. You may grow in maturity, but friend, you're never going to get any more qualified to be in His presence than you already are right now. 
You know, legalism sometimes can just drain the life out of people. And I know I was raised in a tradition that could get a little bit legalistic and the preaching could be about how imperfect I was and if you've got sin in your life, why don't you check your heart this morning? You know, there's seasons and times for those kind of things, but let me just say this to you this morning. It, you can keep looking on the inside and you're going to keep seeing problems. What you need to do is look to the cross. Look to Jesus Christ. He's the author and finisher of your faith. He's taking full responsibility of what He can do in you. You're His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He's not going to make a mistake. Just look all the way to Him because condemnation can keep you from experiencing the love of God. It can lock you up. It can cause you to hide from God. It can cause you to shut your emotions down. You know, God wants us to be emotional with Him. He's emotional. He wants to reciprocate that emotion back to you, from you to Him. He, he wants to get vulnerable with you. You know, God just wants to sit down. You know, if Jesus was here this morning, He'd sit, he'd sit down there at your feet, sit in the style and look you in the eyes and say, you, you amaze me. You're amazing. I love you just like you are. You know, you mean everything to me. If you were the only one, I would, have, I would have done it all. I would have paid the price just for you because you're so special. You know, that's what God's saying this morning. He wants His people to know that you matter, that you're special. You know, there was this minister. He was from Fort Worth, and he was an associate pastor, and he decided he was going to go to the Toronto Revival in the mid-90s. So he flew up there. He booked his ticket for seven days, and he thought, okay, you know, it's probably going to be great. He walked around in the revival, and he could see God moving. At first, he said, you know, I think God's here, but I just don't think he wants to come to me like I see this person on the floor crying and weeping, and this person's back there trembling and shaking under the power of God, and I see that gentleman on his knees weeping before God, and I see some just in ecstasy of worship. He said, I don't feel anything. He said he was just walking around feeling like maybe he didn't matter or he didn't qualify. But deep down, he loved God. And by, he decided, I'll just stay through the whole seven days because my, my ticket, my flat back's a week from now. By the end of the week, he had not been touched at all. He felt disappointed and disillusioned. So he decided, okay, I'm just going to go home. This must not have been God. He began to come to that conclusion. On the flight back, he began to feel this urge to forgive someone that had hurt him. Well, that's strange. He didn't feel anything, but all of a sudden he's feeling his heart warm. He felt warm tears coming down his face. He felt a slight little tremble in his hand. He said, I'm just feeling this overwhelming love for this person that hurt me so bad. What's going on? And a few minutes later, his whole body started trembling. He began to wail in that plane. And he said he didn't care who was watching him. He began to cry out to God. He got a breakthrough. He got a breakthrough of the love of God. And I want to tell you, he thought there was barriers, that he wasn't good enough. But God broke in in that moment when he was on his way home and he gave up. God knows just exactly where you are. He knows how to break into your world and give you a big hug. And he just gave this guy a hug and he said, you know what? I know it's God because of fruit. You don't start forgiving when you get around Satan. I know God's moving there. And it changed his life. He went back many other times. You know, but sometimes Jesus, when he came to the revelator, when he came to John, he said, John, you know, he gave him this word for the church in Revelations 2, 3. He said, you have patiently suffered with me without quitting, but I have this complaint against you. Now listen, this is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Ancient of days. And I'm sure he said it with a sad look on his face, maybe some tears in his eyes. And he said, but you don't love me like you once did. You know, and I started thinking about that. Why, why sometimes does, like this gentleman from Fort Worth, why did his love grow cold? You know, it, it comes down to he didn't feel worthy. He didn't feel accepted. He didn't feel like God really loved him. He was just wanting to participate. He don't want to go to hell. He wants to learn. He was sincere. But there was a barrier called condemnation. 
And sometimes condemnation can put up a barrier in your life and cause you to feel prideful. Even you can be self-protecting. And pride will turn you away from the love of God because you don't want to lose control. But also a lack of emotion. Just being bottled up inside. You know, I think God wants to give us permission to get a little bit more emotional with Him. To get a little bit more tender with Him. So this morning, this message is, is about that upward journey. You know, many messages that we can talk about in the body of Christ have to do with at least these three topics. They're all basically under these three headings. We, we, we preach about the inward journey. That's the inner healing. We preach about the outward journey. That's the mission. We preach, we preach about the upward journey. And that's that pursuit of God, that intimacy with God. You know, we've got to deal with those inward journey. We need a balance of messages from about the inward, outward, and upward journey because we're all on all three at this point in our lives, and we'll always be pursuing one of these journeys. Sometimes God will I'll bring an emphasis on one of these journeys for a season in your life, but you're on each one of these journeys. And if we only focus on inner healing issues, what can happen? We can get self-focused. If we only focus on the outward mission, we can get dry. If we only focus on the upward mission, we can become unfruitful, possibly, because if all you ever do is pray and intercede, then you may not go out like this precious lady said and, and share the gospel with others. So God wants you to have a balanced diet of all three of these sort of things in your life all the time, steadily, a steady stream of all three. And sometimes a good message occasionally will reach all three and hit on all three or maybe emphasize one and, and, and not so much the other two. But, but God wants us to hear each one of these messages. And today, I felt like God was just saying, we, we need to get on this upward journey with him. We need to, to pursue him, be connected to his love. And I was thinking about the love of God a lot this week. And Ephesians came to mind. Ephesians 3.17, it says, Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him, and your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. And may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. You know, I believe this apostle had experienced God in some very deep and precious ways. And he had begun to understand how deep and how wide and how amazing the love of God is. And I want us to come to a place this morning where we, we can encounter that love. And at the end of this message, I may do a couple of songs and we'll do a little prayer time. And we're just going to take a moment and just get very intimate with God and give him some love and receive some love back from him. But as I was saying earlier, it's the condemnation that can so separate people from this love. And that's why I wanted to read to you Romans 5 and 9. It says, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship was God, with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in the wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. You know, we've been made friends of God because of the blood of the cross. There was this young man, I don't know if any of you know Dutch Sheets. Has anyone here heard of him? He got hurt real bad when he was 17 years old. His father left with the secretary and ran off to another state. And he said it completely destroyed him. It closed his emotions to God. It caused him to feel angry toward God. And so he began to think, well, maybe God's this way. So he walked away from God for a few years. Or so he tried. He spent a couple of years smoking pot, drinking beer, partying. And one night he was in a club. And he was as high, he said, as a kite. And he was standing in front of these big speakers, and it was booming so loud, and he, he couldn't even hardly think. He was just so out of his mind. And all of a sudden, he heard the voice of God speak to him very tenderly. 
He said, what are you doing here? He said, son, no matter how far you run, this will never satisfy you. He said his heart began to get warm. He started feeling some emotion. He immediately left out of that barn, started walking down the sidewalk. Tears came down his face, and the, the question came to his mind, God, what were you doing in there? <laughs> and God spoke to him and said, I was there because I was with you. And then he said, he thought, I wonder if I can still speak in tongues. He said, I've been running from God for two years. Maybe he hasn't left me. And he said, so he went to his, motel, or to his room. He laid on the bed and began to speak in an unknown tongue and began to cry and reconnect with God. And that was when he rededicated his life. And you can see the ministry and the man of God that he became. But had, but had God been mad? Had God been trying to get to him? Had God been trying to punish him for every little weakness in his life? He would have never found the love of God. I don't think Dutch was saying God was justifying his lifestyle. I think that Dutch was saying God was validating me as his son. And he knew I'd had some trouble. He knew I was weak, but he was far more understanding than any person he had ever known could be. And that's the God that we serve. He's far more tender, far more gracious, far more understanding, far more accepting than you could ever imagine. And we change and we grow because we're accepted, not to gain it with Him. We are already fully embraced and accepted. And you know the Pharisees, they had a time with Jesus and all this grace and love and miracles and helping people. And one day they barged in a room and grabbed a woman up. And they said she'd been caught in the very act of adultery. And about, I don't know, maybe 12, 10 of them began to clamor around her in their long gray beards and their priestly robes and their self-righteous mentality and they begin to drag her out to the crowd and before Jesus and they threw her down at his feet she landed in the dust I'm sure with her clothes tattered with tears going down her eyes knowing now she's been caught she's been exposed I'm sure she felt hated and despised and unloved and one of the chief Pharisees said so now Jesus the law of Moses says that because she was caught in the act of adultery, she should be stoned. What do you say? They were trying to trap him. You know, Jesus was cool under pressure. I'm sure he stood there for a moment and peered around. He looked down at the woman. He said, I'll tell you what, okay? Someone here that has never sinned, break off a shard of that law, go ahead and get you a stone, and go ahead and do it. Come on, do it. Stone her. Well, you know those men were standing there and they're thinking. And then Jesus began to kneel down. And he began to write in the dust. And I believe what he was writing in the dust was like the etched stone Ten Commandments where God's finger wrote into the stone the Ten Commandments. And he began to write the law in the ground. And I'm sure these men began to see these commandments and they knew they were guilty. And they had brought this woman there to condemn her and to break her and to beat Jesus at his own game. But what Jesus done was he turned the tables on them and simply said, if you're so righteous and you're so innocent, you take her out. Well, I know that older man, the oldest one, had that stone in his hand. He began to sweat, and I'm sure that his hands turned purple. But he kept thinking about some things that he had done, and he wasn't feeling quite as prideful as he had a moment ago. And he dropped the stone. And it said from the oldest to the youngest, they each began to drop the stones one by one. I'm sure that youngest guy was there and he was zealous. 
you know, he wanted to really throw a right curve, a good curve ball. But he dropped the stone. And they all left. And then Jesus looked up, saw the woman there laying before him in this tattered condition, beaten and bruised. What these men didn't realize is that the law of God had brought her right where she needed to be, at the feet of Jesus. Legalism and the law and the old covenant was never intended to make people right with God. It was intended to show us how far we were from Him and how gracious He was in reaching to us. And she was laying before the only one that could help her. The law brought her to grace. And she had a moment with the King of Kings, with the one who loved her more than any man had ever loved her, the one who loved her more than even her children loved her. And I know something happened in her heart that day. And he said, maybe he said this in his own, in that language, sweetheart, where are those that condemned you? She looked around and saw that they were all gone. He said, neither will I condemn you. Neither will I condemn you. Jesus came to the world to save sinners, not condemn the world. The world was condemned already. He came to set the world free. He came to give you a free pass. Salvation is not a gift that you can earn. Salvation is not something you can get good enough for and finally someday attain to it. It's a free gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift, my friends. It's a gift. This woman didn't deserve not to be condemned, but God Himself lifted her up from that moment. She came to the one who could help him, her. She found the one. She found the, those eyes that pierced into her that loved her. She found the love of God. And then He said something very remarkable. He said, I don't condemn you either. Now you can go and you'll do better. You can sin no more. Now you can because when you lift a condemnation, you can change. You can encounter God. You can find that place of God. But I want some of you in here today, and God's talking to someone this morning about getting off your own back. God's saying you're your worst enemy. You're your biggest problem. God, I'm your cheerleader. I'm running on the sidelines, zagging you on. And for somehow the enemy's making you think that I'm mad, that I'm out to get you, that I'm waiting on you to make one more stake. Boom! You mess up again. That's not the God that we serve this morning, my friends. He's a God of grace and love and tenderness and mercy. And how many of you, how many of you know about the Reformation period and Martin Luther? Did you know he had the same struggle? He came up in the Catholic tradition of that time, and the Catholic tradition of that time was a little off the wall. It had slipped to the side. And I love Catholics, and wow, have they came around. So much great things going on in the Catholic church. There's always not things you may not like, but, but God's at work with these people. He loves them. They're his people too. He's not validating how much he loves them based on how much knowledge of God's word or they don't have how good or bad they are. He loves them because they put their trust in the cross. And they may fix their eyes on that crucifix, but they know He's the one that saved them. But Luther, he was down on himself. And I think maybe someone slipped in here this morning. Luther said, I could... His, his question when he was a boy was, am I good enough to be loved? And that question burned in his heart and he, he would say to himself, I don't think I'm good enough to be loved. I don't think God really cares. So he decided to just take an austere lifestyle and he pursued God and he would punish himself and he would struggle and he would go to confession and they said he would go to confession and stay six hours thinking of anything, trying to make himself right with God that he could have done wrong to make God mad at him. He confessed and confessed. He wore the priest out. And then he would leave the confessional and think he had it all worked out where he felt a little bit of peace. Maybe he was good enough now. Maybe God can accept him now. And he would remember something else and come back in. And the priest would say, oh my, here he is again. 
he would come back in, he would sit back down, go through a, another litany of lists of things that he he he'd forgotten or that he had done on his way out. And he was in this struggle for a long time. Sometimes your struggle is your ministry. Some, sometimes that struggle you're in is because a lot of other people are going to learn from, your, from what you went through when you tell your story. That same miracle of deliverance is going to come. He began, as he got older, to get desperate to get right with God. He said, I have got to please Him, but I don't know if I can. If the great commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, he said, God's always going to be mad at me because I could never do it. I, I want to. But I can tell that there's things that get in my way and I have weaknesses. He was focusing on himself instead of on the cross. And I know some of us look inward a little bit too much. You can get too introspective. I know we don't hear a lot of preaching like that. But sometimes the best thing you can do is just worship God and put your faith that you're accepted. It's a faith walk. You may not feel like he's accepted you, but I'm going to tell you right now that he said he did by the blood of Jesus. He drew you near and made you a friend. Not just someone that can come maybe bow down before him, and if you worship good enough, bring him a little closer. No, you're welcome right now, just like you are. Run to him. He's your friend. He's your best friend. Luther would whip himself with whips. He'd begin to cut himself. He was serious. He was going to go ahead and punish himself. He was going to get himself right with God. He went to the extreme of self-effort. How many of you here have ever got in a state where you felt like you were striving a little bit too much for, for God's favor? I know I have. And one day Luther just went back to his room. He picked up his... They had Bibles back then. They had just begun printing them. The printing press had come out. He began to read Romans. And he read that, that the just, the just shall live by faith. That one sentence, he said something happened in that moment. He said he'd been reading and reading and trying and beating himself and fasting and confessing. And one day the light bulb went off. The just, the just will live by faith. He said he had a new birth experience. That was the first time in his life that, it broke, that the light of God had broken through. And he saw what it was all about. He said, my faith is based on Christ alone. He has paid the price, walked the perfect life, and give me the opportunity to walk with him perfectly by faith alone. And not by works. Lest we get prideful like the Pharisees. And you know what happens when you get self-righteous? You get judgmental. You know the person that's not loving on God like they need to is the very one that's critical, judgmental, harsh, hard to deal with, unforgiving. But we don't want to be like that. We want to be that merciful person that knows the merciful high priest. We want to be like Mary and we want to sit at Jesus' feet and love on him. We don't want to miss the moment with our busyness. You know, Martha was washing the dishes. And she was, I'm sure, very proud of herself. Making a beautiful meal. And Mary was just sitting in there like the just shall live by faith one. And she was sitting at his feet listening to his words. She had found the tenderness of his heart. And she said, she, she chose to sit there. She resisted the cry to work harder, to get busy, do more. And said, I just want to sit here. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you're so worried and troubled about so many things. But Mary has found it. And it will not be taken from her. When you find it, God will protect it. When you ever find that place in Him, He'll come down like a guard. 
He'll set up angels around you. He'll make sure you can worship. He'll make sure you have time for Him. He'll do whatever it takes to keep you at His feet. Once you find that place, He will never let you be removed from it. And we still have jobs. We know that. We have to stay, but you'll stay at His feet. And you'll never let the busyness of your life distract you from that one joy, that one thing this is all about. That's what this is all about, that relationship. You know what Christianity is all about? It's not about right doctrine. That's important. But all that is given to us is just to help us understand what it's really about. It's about relationship. It's about friendship. It's about making a personal connection with God. You know, Romans 8.33 says, Who dare accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then can condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he's sitting in the place of honor at the right hand of God pleading for us. Not talking against you. Luther didn't know who was on his side until that one day. And he met the Lord and he fell in love with him. And God changed the whole complexion of the church through one man's devotion. One day, Jesus said, I've seen you whip yourself and crawl up the stairs on your knees long enough. I've seen enough. And all along, the word was right there. Luther realized that the word of God would change the world. He realized that the one thing that the, the, the medieval world needed was the word of God. And what we need to do is get back to that wonderful word. And then when you read these scriptures, you'll see who we're dealing with. You know, the, mat the natural man is about performance. The natural man is about working to get approval. That, that's a carnal disposition. But the spiritual person realizes that they work from this place of approval. And that makes work so much more fun, so much more joyous, so much more beautiful, so much more encounter-centered. I, want, I want, to hear, want you to hear what Paul said. He said, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it on the cross. He took it away and nailed it on the cross. You know, that verse right there, I was counseling a young lady one day. She was, I could see she was under complete condemnation and it's because she had gotten married, had two kids, divorced her husband, married another man, and then divorced him and was about to get in another relationship. And she came to me one day and she said, I've asked God to forgive me. I know I've made these mistakes. But I could see she was nowhere near accepting his forgiveness. And I read this verse to her. I said, Sister, he canceled. Have you asked God to forgive you of some of, that, of those things? She said, of course I have. I said, then, you, then he has. Settled. Don't ask him again. He did it. You've got to understand this by faith. Don't look for that feeling right now. Just believe what I'm telling you. He forgave you. And he took what you've done and he went <laughs> on the cross. All of it. All the charges against you. And he said, I paid enough of a price to take this for you. If you need more than this, it disrespects me, baby. It disrespects me, son. Don't think you need more than this. This is enough. I'm enough. Because now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many of you are glad? There's no condemnation. There's none. Now when you realize that, you won't draw back there in worship moments like we had beautifully this morning. You'll just go ahead and go for it. Just go. Don't, the devil won't be able to remind you, hey, you know, what are you doing with your hands up? Have you ever went to a, a church, and I hate to say this, but I visited a lot of churches in my time, 
And I brought my young children in. They sat down and they were scuffling around. And I could just feel people looking at us like, where did you come from? They were really exuding the love of God. And it makes you feel uncomfortable. You would even feel condemned. Well, maybe I shouldn't have brought my kids in here. But you know, God wants us to be loving like I see this church is. When I walked in here this morning, I felt so loved. When I talked to Aaron, I felt so respected. You know, we need to be respected. I want to be respected. You want to be respected. You, sh you deserve to be respected. You deserve to be loved. You deserve to be honored. You're special. You're important. You mean something. You have value. This is true. And when we realize that the people around us matter, things change. I mean, you start seeing what's best for this person. How can I make a difference in their life? What's this about this towel that Jesus was talking about? You know, John said God is love. And he said we beheld the love of God. And we came to trust in his love. You know, I wonder, how did the Apostle John come to that conclusion? Because he walked with Jesus. And he saw what happened with a woman caught in adultery. He had never seen anything like it before. Is this really how God is? You mean, I know he's God. I mean, I've seen, it, seen it, him on the Mount of Transfiguration. I've seen dead people raised. I know this guy's God. Is this how God is? Because John's getting a wake-up call because he was a son of thunder. When you don't do what John wanted when he first met Jesus, let's call down fire on these Samaritans. And Jesus said, John, you don't even know what spirit you're speaking of. Did God come to destroy men's life or to save it? No, everything about him is to save you. Everything about him is to promote you, to give you a breakthrough, to come with revival, to bless you financially. He's about raising you up, not bringing you down. He's a change agent. He can step into your world and reroute some things and rock your world. Just give him a chance. Just believe him. Stop believing the lie that you're going to have to spend three hours a day praying about something you did when you were 16 years old, sister, and get up and rise up and be that saint and that prayer warrior that God's called you to be. He called you to rise up and shake the throne of God. And you can. And when you pray, things happen and people change. He moves things when you move. But when you're self-loathing, and you're whipping yourself down. Have you ever noticed how your prayers will turn for, oh, God, I'm just sorry. He said, you know, that's the tenth time in the last 15 minutes you've said you were sorry about that. And then you've been saying that every day for 10 years. He said, I'm done with it. I, what are you talking about? I done forgot that. I done threw that in a sea of forgetfulness. Don't keep reminding me of how much you've done because I don't know what you've done. All I know is when you walk up, God gets up. God moves. He wants to put the towel on and serve you. He's not trying to hurt you. He's saying what you need. Because he's your friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll walk up and back you up. And he's not keeping a record against you, my friend. If he was, none of us could stand. Luther came to that conclusion. He said, I can't get to even the most basic of the commandments that all the other ones are based on. How will I ever please him? You never will in your natural self. His pleasure comes from the blood of the cross. And your faith in it. When you say, I value what you've done. I value the price you paid. Instead of spending so much time worried about all that you've done wrong and your failures, spend some time honoring what he's done. Say, I thank you that you paid the price on that cross. That you got in a fight for me and you've made a difference in my life. Look where he's brought you from. I'll conclude with this last story. There was this man swimming offshore. And there had been a warning that there were sharks 
They had normally not in that area, but they had warned them. There's been a shark sighting in this area. And he's like, he loved to dive, and he was used to getting down and looking at the cool reefs off the floors, Florida shores. He knew his way around underwater. He had a little boat. He just anchored it and just fell back out of it and was down underwater, enjoying himself. And boom! A shark came by and hit him with the nose and knocked him. He, felt like, he said it felt like a car had hit him. And he said he began to struggle to try to get to the top, and he said four or five more began to come in, and they were, they were cruising around looking at him serious. He said he felt one grab him by the ankle, and he began to feel it pull him down. He said he knew it could have bit his foot off, but it seemed like he just kept his latched teeth into his bones and into his flesh and pulled him down. He said, man, they're playing with me, but this ain't no game. And suddenly there was some fishermen over some shrimpers off the shore a little bit, and they came in their boat because they saw the rustling of the waters. They saw him emerge a few times and heard his yell. And they came over and threw a life vest in the water with a rope on it. And they said, grab it. Grab it right now. And he tried to grab it, and every time he would get his arm around it, one of them would take a hold of him and move him down again and pull him loose. They were too powerful. The resistance was beyond anything he ever felt. He said he never tried to get to the shore so hard but could do nothing but what they allowed him to do. There was nothing he could do. He was powerless against these forces. And he said he tried one more time to reach it. He said he was almost out of breath. His tank had been knocked off. He knew he only had moments to live. And he said he looked in the water and a diver had emerged in the water with him with the shark electronic rod, a shock rod. And he said he began to tap those sharks and they would flee this way and they would test it again. He tapped them three or four times and they began to move away from him. And he said, and then this diver with a real strong arm clutched him around underneath his arms and began to swim him to the shore. He said he was weak, he had no power. There was nothing he could do. And he said he latched on to that pulley with, with, through, through that life jacket, through that life vest with me. And the captain began to pull both of us. But I could have never held on had he not held me to the life jacket. And he said, they pulled us into the boat. And I fell down. And he said, I went unconscious for a few moments. And I just could not figure out how in the world the man rescued me so easily and so quickly. He said, I, I thought I was gone. And when he could finally come to himself enough, he said, Captain, because he looked around the boat, he said, where's the other diver? And the captain said, sir, there's no other diver. You latched hold to the jacket and we pulled you in. He knew in that moment that somebody got in a fight with him. And I'm going to tell you, life can be tough like a bunch of sharks coming against you. It can pull at you. He, they can be biting at you. The forces of evil are beyond your ability to conquer without somebody's help. This is not something you can earn. You can fight the forces. Or you can surrender to the one who can bring you out. Jesus got in the fight and saved his life. And you know what? He got in with you. Sister, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're going through, sir. I don't know what you've been through and overcame back there. But you know what I'm talking about this morning. Some of you in here say, I remember that time. I can remember that time. I didn't think I was going to make it. My back was against a wall. There was no hope. And God moved. He moved. He moved. And I'm going to tell you something. When God moves, there's no forces can stand against.